Okay, hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, really excited to have you guys here today. Um, today we are talking diversity hiring strategies, um, what's working and what's not working. Um, really a pleasure to have um, our guests today speaking about uh, this wonderful topic. Um, for over the next couple of minutes, we're going to allow more people to join, um, but just want to allow some, uh, some basic housekeeping. There's, there's questions and answers that we'll be allowing um, throughout the, uh, the hour-long segment. So feel free to chime in with additional questions if you'd like to further explore anything or specifically point any questions to any of our um, speakers today. Um, I'm really excited to have some, some wonderful guests here. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce and, and welcome Tamika Curry-Smith. She's a global diversity, equity, and inclusion executive with experience with experience leading DEI at Nike, Mercedes-Benz, Target Corporation, and Deloitte. Uh, real people-centered, data-driven, results-oriented leader whose career spans 25 years, both in corporate America and as an entrepreneur. Um, welcome, Tamika. And also, uh, Michelle Shelton, really for more than two decades, has been a trusted advisor, coach, and mentor to leaders within the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, um, simultaneously leading her own teams to reimagine work uh, throughout her career journey in civil rights enforcement and DEI. Michelle was noted for being an inspirational leader um, with a rare trifecta of talent and visionary thinking, strategic collaboration and tactical execution. Um, today, uh, Michelle is in demand for her candid approaches to creating coaching, consulting and conference experiences that promote organizational justice and unity. Um, author of the upcoming book, The Simplicity of Diversity and available to keynote, coach and consult on an international basis. Welcome to Michelle. Thank um, you, Michael. Also, also want to introduce Scott Almog, um, veteran of the recruiting technology sector, a uh, real co-founder and, and CEO of Telenia, the world's most advanced diversity talent sourcing solution. Uh, welcome, Gal. Thank you, Michael. Happy to be here. Um, and uh, happy to, uh, to see, you know, both Tamika and Michelle with us tonight and you, Michael. Oh. Wonderful. Uh, I'm I'm calling from Israel, where I, uh, you know, spend most of my time just to uh, to let everyone know the uh, geographies, and it's now 6 p.m. for me. Thank you so much. And um, no, really, you know, glad to dive straight in and with uh, you know diversity. Um, it's really been such a um, a hot topic uh, most recently in the past couple of years. I know that um, the position of a chief diversity officer is really one of the fastest growing positions in corporate America. I know that we've seen uh, evidence of real, a lot of strategies, a lot of uh, corporations really looking to, to implement diversity hiring strategy and really, and really uh, you know, include DEI as a, as a major focus, um, I'd love to begin with really, you know, talking about what's resonating the most uh, when it comes to diversity and including strategies. What, what are companies actually, uh, you know, talking about these days with um, a diversity strategy from the top level down? Um, Tamika, would it be okay to begin the conversation with question on really for, for DE&I um, what's really most impactful? What's resonating most for corporate America? Yes, well, first of all, thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here and engage in this really important conversation. As you shared in the introduction, I, you know, I've had the pleasure of leading DEI as, as a CDO in a number of organizations. I've consulted with dozens more CDOs and organizations overall uh, in this space. And I will tell you that before we even get to the strategy, 
what I think is really important and what I start with, with the people that I uh, work with and that I think will hopefully be helpful for, for those of you attending is, what is your philosophy and your approach to DEI? Because I think oftentimes people just jump in to a list of strategies and tactics and don't take a step back and say like, how are we thinking about this work? And what I found and what, and what I share is I call it the three eyes, the three eyes that really set the foundation for your vision for how you will execute whatever DEI strategies you come up with. And the three eyes are intention, integration, and investment. So when we talk about uh, intention, you have to be intentional about making DEI a priority in your organization. Quite frankly, that's why we haven't seen the progress that many organizations have tried to achieve over time. And I'll even say since George Floyd was murdered and the you know two years that have passed since, it's also why we haven't seen uh, the change that I thought many uh, had hoped would happen. Now, granted, there's been some change, but I wouldn't say the pace of change has been dramatically different. And I think it's because um, organizations aren't making DI a priority and being intentional about it. So you have to basically make it a state of priority from the top down. You have to get leaders uh, engaged in this work. And um, I can say, for example, you know, I intend to lose weight, but if I don't change my eating habits and work out, I'm not going to lose weight. So that's what's happened is, is companies will make these statements we care about DEI, we're gonna drive change, and then they don't do anything differently. So be intentional and then follow that up with actions that you're going to take uh, to make that intention uh, come true. The second is integration. So although many companies have uh, someone leading DEI or maybe it's not someone's full-time job, but, but it's perhaps someone that's doing it in addition to their day job. And that, that to me is, it's important to have someone kind of be the focal point, but DEI has to be owned by everyone. It has to be a, a priority for everyone and everyone's responsibility. So I use the, the analogy of companies have a CFO or a chief financial officer. That person sets the strategy, the, the financial philosophy that the company then follows the policies, practices, et cetera. But then everyone in the company is expected to be a good financial steward. You can't go and blow money. You can't. You have to follow the the time. You know the traveling protocols, et cetera, whatever it is. That is the same way I want people to view diversity, equity, and inclusion. You have a CDO or you have a leader that's setting the vision and the strategy for the company, but then everyone is responsible for making that vision come to life. And so DEI should have a mindset around how do we integrate this into how we operate, so it's just what we do. So it's less about DEI recruiting strategies, but it's about how do we recruit. It's less about uh, development and learning, and it's about how do we develop our talent and what is our learning strategies. It's less about um, DEI in the community, and it's like, how do we engage the people in our community? How do we build our business that grows and attracts people from all walks of life? So the integration piece is key um, because if you take a mindset around integration, DEI will never be siloed off on its own trying to drive change. And then the last one is, is the investment angle. And this is one where uh, it's a huge opportunity for organizations. Um, it is well known that DEI does not get funded in the way that it should. Uh, in fact, about half of CDOs, and I was actually shocked it's not more than that, say that a lack of investment and that investment being both budget and resources, human resources to help drive the work is what's actually um, standing in the way of making progress, right? And so I think organizations have to put their money where their mouth is. And if they really believe and say this work is important and it's a business imperative, then fund it and invest in it appropriately to drive change. That's wonderful. Very specific, uh, you know, three three eyes to really get our conversation started and really right, beginning with the philosophy of how do you approach, uh, you know, DEI uh, within an organization. Um, 
Michelle, would you like to speak on that? Really, uh, you know, when introducing the the topic of diversity, not, not, not an easy topic to, to bring up, but I think that right in your experience, uh, when speaking to to leaders, they're they're definitely wanting to um, you know approach and and improve. Um, how how would you begin the conversation with diversity with senior leaderships? Uh, thanks for the question, Michael. And uh, I too want to just say thank you to uh, you and, and Gal and, and Talenya for the invitation to be a part of today's discussion. I'm looking forward to a spirited and certainly inform informative experience for all of your listeners. And uh, it's a, my delight to serve with these other distinguished panelists. Um, we actually have a uh, an approach that I that we utilize in working with our clients and we actually call it the AAA approach. It's interesting to me, it has the three I's. Mine is the three A's. And we spend quite a bit of time working with organizations on the front end because what we find is while everyone recognizes this is important, it needs to happen, they have no clue where to start, how to start. And a lot of what stalls most organizations with making progress and ultimately puts them in the position of where they are displaying performative diversity as opposed to real results. Um, they give the appearance that they're committed, that they have statements and policies, but there's no weight behind them. There's no meat behind them. Tamika talks about the investment of resources. It's critical. One of the things that we encourage our folks to do is start at the very beginning, that first A being awareness. You've got to be clear about who you are as an organization and also accept and acknowledge the missteps that you've been making all along. When it comes to human resources, it's critical for HR to take a step back, whether they're fully assigned the responsibility of overseeing DEI or not, HR has in many ways been the unit that has continued to perpetuate a lot of these inequities that we're seeing in organizations because they have been the place where decisions have been made about hiring, decisions have been made about compensation, decisions have been made within the HR round. And that's a hard truth for a lot of HR folks to confront. But the reality is, you know, when we work with our clients, that's what we're all about is truth telling, confronting and conquering the isms that threaten both our humanity and bottom line, whether intentional or not. So we encourage our organizations to be honest and candid about what they have in place systemically that has continued to perpetuate the issues that require a further commitment and more progress around diversity, equity and inclusion. So when you're looking at all of your processes specific to sourcing, where do you go to look for candidates? Are you just waiting for folks to come to you or are you depending on your employees, especially if you have a homogeneous representation within your workforce? If you have leaders and there's no people of color that are on your leadership team, if you're depending on your employees to send you good candidates, then you're gonna to continue to get what you've always gotten. So let's be honest about how intentional are we about going out looking for the diversity that we know we need to have within our organizations. Let's be clear about who we say we are, the promises that we're, we make to folks when they come into our organizations to begin working, and how, how much integrity do we exercise around maintaining and keeping those promises so that everyone is having the experience that we promise to offer as an employer, regardless of who they are, where they come from. That is what gets you to that place of really understanding, are you serious about making a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion? Where are some of those places where you have opportunities to improve? The next a, if you will, beyond awareness, and also with awareness, let me say this, is getting clear around what DEI is. It's important to note that a lot of organizations use these terms interchangeably, as if they're all one and the same, and they're actually very different. It's critical to make sure we understand the definitions of diversity, what it means, the concepts associated with that, equity, inclusion, and the process that is associated with moving through, if you will, that, that trifecta. That's the clarity that's necessary around awareness. When it comes to authenticity, authenticity speaks to your capacity as an organization to really address this. To make a mentioned earlier, it's important that we don't place the responsibility for DEI on one person. And that's even if you have a chief diversity officer, we encourage our clients to make sure that everyone in the organization understands that DEI is the responsibility of everyone. So let's look at your capacity to really take on the responsibilities and the understanding, the commitments that are necessary to advance the work and talk about where you're falling short. Do we need to upskill across the board? Do we need leaders who need to be coached on their personal and professional understanding and challenges that they have as it relates to leading this work? 
Do we have a team of people who are in place who are committed to overseeing and setting, if you will, strategy? So there is no one person who feels like their responsibility falls solely on their shoulders. Tamika mentioned that there are a lot of CDOs, chief diversity officers who don't have resources. And one of those primary resources is having a team beyond the investment of funds, but having people within the organization that can support them with manifesting whatever strategy is developed. And we always encourage our organizations not to leave it up to one person to develop that strategy, but to make sure that there's weigh in across the organization on what should happen, because ultimately it's gonna take that buy-in from folks at every level of the organization for them to be successful. In addition to that, if we have managers, it's critical to engage them, provide, before we expect them to reach diversity goals, we've got to prepare them to do so. So if there's a need to train and develop the leaders at every level of the organization so that they understand what is being asked and is expected of them. They're being prepared to be successful and empowered to make decisions that support the work. It's critical to make sure that that happens. So that's again, asking the question of who are we and what is our capacity, if you will, to make this work. And once we have all of that together, you know, then you can look at really taking action steps. So the biggest challenge that many companies make is they see it was trending. They see everyone else making commitments to diversity, equity, and inclusion. They say everyone else put out a statement, which we saw a lot of that after George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and, and so many others. There are too many to name. Everyone put out a statement. We have yet two years later to really see the progress that needs to be made so that those statements are coming to fruition within not just the organization's perspective of what's happening in its culture, but in the lives of the people who are affected by these organizations. No, that's fantastic, absolutely. And so definitely, you know, very good to, to really start at a, at a beginning point, really, you know, analyze where are we in the organization, what before we actually can, can, can achieve or accomplish, Right, let's start from the very beginning and define and make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, Gal, I wanna give you the chance to speak really with regards to running corporations, running organizations, um, the value and the uh, approach to diversity, um, certainly within gender, race, uh, you know, what have you. Sorry, Gal, let's see if we can unmute. Do you hear me? Yes. All right, so uh, Tamika had the three I's. Michelle had the three A's. I have the three W's. <laughs> I just made it up. Uh, but, but uh, you know, uh, the first one uh, correlates with awareness and intention, and I would call it will. So companies need to uh, have the will to make a change, okay? Uh, and they need to have a strong will. The second W, which is probably the most important in my view, because we deal with the recruitment uh, technologies and recruitment of diversity uh, talent. The second uh, W is weapons. If you go into the battle without the weapon and without the ammunition to, uh, to win, you're gonna fail. If you have the weapon, then you have the third W, which is win. And I think that uh, uh, winning needs to be measured and celebrated because success and winning brings more winning. And uh, I think everyone in the in the market in the world understand the value of diversity to the bottom line of the company, not just to the brand and to the image of the company, to the bottom line. Uh, but you know, they send recruiters to the battlefield without real weapons. You know, they say. Okay, we gotta have, uh, you know, two black candidates, three women in the slate, and you better get them. But they send them to source on LinkedIn, where the only thing they can do is look at pictures and name and figure out who is who. And it's hard enough to hire uh, for position these days for any position, regardless of diversity. So recruiters start seeing diversity hiring as a burden while there are now technologies and tools that allow them to do it a lot more efficiently and with little effort and companies need to have the will to implement such technologies and to make sure they're being utilized and demonstrate everyone that, you know, if they use them, they can be wins. That's my perspective. 
No, I think it's I think it's excellent, and especially uh, you know in in uh, recent times with the great resignation, you know, employees are really selecting and wanting to be a part of the organization as as much as you know any other you know point in history. So you know, definitely want to be able to to uh, achieve and, and celebrate success and really make it aware for everyone so that everyone's really uh, in common. Um, so then, you know, on this on the same topic that you know, Tamika, Gal, Michelle, that we've that we've mentioned with regards to engaging the entire group, not leaving it up to to one person only. So of course, you know, it's it's an achievement to have achieved diversity. Well, to start with a statement and then and then continue forward to to appoint a chief diversity officer, and that's definitely a, a great starting point. And then uh, I think Michelle, you were talking about. What about the resource, the investment of a team of, of having someone, uh, you know, um, that that it that it is their full time job, or it's included as as really a focus. Um, comments on trying to on trying to get, uh, you know, everyone on board. Uh, Tamika, I really liked your example on on the financial fiscal responsibilities for it's for everyone in the company to be aware and, and kind of make those choices. Um, advice or or comments on on trying to get everyone aware of diversity and inclusion in, in, in everyone's mind across the board, Tamika? Yeah, I mean, I think organizations also have to kind of take a step back. I love uh, I love all of our, you know, three, the A's, the I's and the W's, but and understand their compelling why, like, why are they doing this? And we can start with the business case for DEI, which is I mean, at this point, it's not in dispute. You can literally Google business case or diversity and get dozens and dozens of dozens of articles. I've been doing DEI work now for 20 years. And when I first started doing it, we didn't have all this empirical evidence and studies and things of that sort, but now we do. And so I think at a broad level, how do you then take that general business case that's out there in society and then articulate it for your organization in a way that makes sense. So making people understand that if you're thinking about, for example, you know, I, I often say it's in, in three buckets, um, talent, business, and community. So if you think about how do we attract and retain the best talent, there's tons of data that shows that uh, particularly in the, the moment we're in now around the great resignation or people are looking for companies that are committed in the space. They're doing research on you to see what are your initiatives and what you're doing. And so leaning into DEI will actually open up your talent pool more because people will see that you're taking it seriously if you do back it up with action and they'll want to be a part of, of driving that chain. So how do you win that war for talent? Uh, and there are tons of data that shows that heterogeneous teams or teams that are different outperform homogeneous teams or teams that are similar in everything from creativity, innovation, problem solving, um, you know, they're higher performing, uh, that leads to higher employee productivity and employee engagement, less turnover, less litigation. I mean, I could go on and on. So helping people understand that that focusing on DEI is actually good for a, from a talent perspective. From your business, same thing. You know, there's tons of data that shows that organizations that focus on DEI, they um, have higher market share, higher customer satisfaction, um, more revenues and profitability, higher stock price. Once again, I could go on and on. So from a business perspective, it's also good. And then if you look at um, whether it's, you know, kind of community more broadly in terms of the, the communities where you live and you operate as an organization, whether it's your investor community, right, and, and whether it's uh, corporate social responsibility, CSR, or ESG, environmental, social, and governance initiatives, DEI is a criteria that they're all looking for and using now to measure, to decide what companies they're going to invest in and will hold you accountable for such. And so I think if you can articulate why it's important, it gives you the platform to then say, okay, what are we going to do and how are we going to do it? So to me, it starts with uh, garnering the audience uh, throughout the company so that they just know why it's important. And I think a lot of companies don't start from that basic level of helping people understand why uh, they're leaning into this. 
that's outstanding. Definitely, uh, you know, um, explaining the benefits, trying to, to bring everyone on board. Um, Michelle, anything to add when it comes to really preparing and, and, and readying the stage, readying the audience for um, the beginning of our, of our you know, diversity actions and strategies? Sure. You know, I think hands down and the research shows the CEO engagement is critical. It's uh, paramount. Anytime an organization is wanting to move forward with engaging in diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, business case, if folks understand it across the board, why it's important, they know it's the right thing to do, but the moves do not happen until the CEA makes it, CEO, excuse me, makes it a stated priority. So uh, all of the companies that show up on the best of diversity lists and what have you, one of the uh, top uh, criteria that they have is CEO engagement. So CEOs make it uh, as much of a priority as every other business imperative that is within the organization. And then ultimately, uh, leaders are held accountable to making sure that they're engaging and helping to advance the work. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. So definitely, you know, getting everyone involved on every level, uh, and then most especially the CEO, that, that chief level. Um, and then well, something that we talked about briefly was really investments and budgets and budgetary constraints. I know that we have, <coughs> excuse me, a couple examples of um, really investment not not really being there. Um, Michelle, can you talk about that? Talk about ways to approach that that challenge. Uh, sure. You know, I, I think it, it it's very simple <laughs> when it comes to it. It's it, those things that are important to you, you put your money into them. And uh, for many organizations, uh, again, going back to this idea of performative diversity, uh, they've fallen into a place of comfort with just hosting and maybe monthly recognition, uh, awareness months, Black History Month, Women's History Month, et cetera. Um, they have their statement, but ultimately the investment comes when you actually develop policy, policy and enforce that policy to ensure that there are stated goals and objectives, that there are metrics for you to measure the work that you're doing. And uh, again, the challenge with many organizations is they just don't know how to move forward with doing that. And that's where engaging oftentimes an external consultant can be beneficial to many organizations. What we're facing right now with respect to chief diversity officers, you know, there was an 84% increase in hiring uh, those individuals in 2020. However, they also have one of the highest turnover rates. We have litigation right now that you only have to do a Google search in the news to find out which companies made some bold statements in 2020 and 2021 who are now being sued by the very folks that they hired to come in and work and lead these efforts. Because what happens when uh, chief diversity officers come in, especially those who are hired to serve specifically in that role with a very intentional and singular focus around DEI, not as just something else to be added to their plate, they come in with an idea with mindsets and you know strategies around how to do the work. But the challenge that many of them run into, and it's reported when they leave these organizations is they arrive, uh, and, and found out that either the CEO was not as engaged or they were not reporting directly to the CEO. Instead, they may be reporting to a VP of HR or an HR director and uh, expected to jump over additional hurdles um, when it comes to engaging HR because HR is very um, territorial when it comes to the people side. And that's okay. That's where they hang out. That is their lane. So we want them to exercise a sense of ownership when it comes to that. However, it's critical when chief diversity officers come in that they have an opportunity to be seen as a legitimate leader within the organization who is there for the success of the organization and who is there to serve as a partner, as a business partner and leader in moving the organization forward. CDOs focus on more than just the workforce if they're doing it effectively. They'll look at every aspect of the business and be very intentional about integrating DEI in everything. So they have an opportunity to engage leaders in every aspect from operations to finance, to uh, human resources, to you know, social responsibility. So that's critical. But what happens for many of them is they come into the organizations and they find out that the company is not as committed to to, uh, doing the work that's necessary to reach the goals that they've stated they'd like to achieve. Again, it's very difficult work. And, and, and I think it's important that folks understand that it's not feel good work at all times. When you start looking at the representation within your organization and knowing that you've fallen short in terms of providing the equal opportunities that we, um, that we promote, uh, it's, it's hard to do that. 
when you look at your mission, vision, and value statement and you get feedback from your workforce that says, no, this isn't the positive experience that I've been having. You have folks who mention uh, experiences with unconscious bias, with microaggressions on a daily basis, folks who feel as if they're being undermined. They don't feel a sense of belonging. It's not easy work. And when chief diversity officers start uncovering all of this, then the organization has a responsibility to act they have a responsibility to move forward, especially if the statement has been, we're committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Many of those officers, however, face the reality that information is um, sometimes stalled. It's, it's difficult getting access to data. Sometimes the officers run into situations where leaders refuse to allow or support them in revealing some of the truths that are exposed in the organization. Sometimes they run into situations where they find out that they were just supposed to be a face in a space. They weren't really expected to come in and do any work. They weren't really expected to come in and challenge um, the, the culture or challenge the decision-making processes within the organizations. So that continues to, again, perpetuate this notion of not belonging, of not feeling included, not being respected and valued for the work that you have been hired to do, <clears throat> excuse me, and any person who values their own contributions finds it difficult to stay in that place, especially when they understand the urgency behind this work. So to sit down and have a conversation with your CEO, if you even have an opportunity to do that and find out that sometimes the goals or the expectations are misaligned, to find out that you're there to do the type of work that is necessary to overhaul a culture, but you don't have the resources, whether it's financially or, or through human capital to be able to do that. You don't have a team of support. Many CDOs find themselves siloed and, and seen as an other, even within the very organizations that they're expected to come in and change. So again, when we think about asking people to come in and do this work, it's critical to make sure that they are fully supported. And, number, and, and again, that organizations understand exactly what it means to have a stated commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and what it looks like to follow through on that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that, uh, you know, you really um, brought up a lot of really good points there, one of which, uh, you know, on the on the idea that right there's a there's a strategy that they they'd like to to bring forward they have some ideas to really begin and they're and they're really starting to confront and, and really have some of these uncomfortable uh, conversations. Um, can I ask Michelle like are there any um, success stories or examples in which someone did kind of come in and you know they have been able to to make an improvement. Uh, anything with regards to you know how they how they first approached and then and then were able to over the course of whether it's you know six months or a year um, they're able to measure some definitive successes. Mm -hmm. You have organizations where they they have figured out you know how to get this right and typically you know those organizations when we what's critical in thinking about <clears throat> how you measure success is number one, what your priorities are gonna be. And of course, we've had a lot of organizations who talk about DEI in general, um, but we've had some who've made very specific decisions very intentionally to focus on racial equity. So DEI covers a myriad of, 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 of course, demographics and attributes, and we can talk about it through the lens of gender, we can talk about it through the lens of sexual orientation, religion, et cetera. We can talk about it through the lens of age, but when it comes to racial equity, I think it's important also to make this distinction that that requires a, a very different and very specific approach when you're looking at specific populations, whether you're wanting to focus on um, Black and African American or Hispanic Latinx. So for organizations, you have to clearly define those goals and identify what it is that you're focused on so that whomever is leading the effort has clarity around what, the, what latitude they do have and, and what ultimately the organization wants to achieve. Those who are successful, again, have situations where you've got a, a, someone who is signed to specifically oversee the work whose expectations are in alignment with, again, I say the CEO, because the CEO is going to be that advocate, the best ally in making sure that any barriers a CDO runs up against um, can be overcome and or eliminated altogether before they even run into them. And then typically those organizations that are successful, they have a DEI committee, a council, a task force that has been put in place so that there is an opportunity to get weigh in 
from across the organization, from a cross-functional perspective. Um, generationally, they make these teams very diverse themselves. You have lists, if you will, um, through Diversity Inc. They have their top 50 companies for diversity that they that they uh, send out every year. And uh, they list some of the best practices of these organizations uh, that show specifically what it is that they're doing. We have lists for the top 50 companies for diversity in terms of uh, where employees and talent can look to see what are some of the companies that would be the best places for them to go and work. But again, when we talk about success, we've got to be clear about where, whether we're talking about just diversity in general, or if we're talking about it from a race-based perspective. Because here's the thing, I can be a Black woman and work at an organization that's committed to diversity, but still not have the experience that is going to be um, the type that helps me to feel valued, respected, and, and certainly um, as if I have a sense of belonging and opportunities to advance there. And that's kind of what's happened in the field is the field has become diluted to the point to where we're focusing on a lot of uh, gender issues that typically benefit white women, um, but aren't really necessarily benefiting people of color. So even as we're having this conversation around diversity, and there's so much that I could go into, but you know, in the interest of time, I won't. Again, it's important for our organizations to understand who you are, where are your challenges, and where do you need to focus primarily in order to really be able to see the change that's needed to support the people who are in your organization. So when you ask the question of are there companies who are being successful, yes, there are. They're the ones who are clear about what their goals are. They're the ones who make sure that they have someone assigned to oversee the work. Everyone is on the same page in terms of what it is that they need to accomplish and the resources are there to make it happen. So it's just, a, a, again, a reiteration of the things that we've already mentioned. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Tamika, would you like to weigh in on this? I mean, I think you cover so much, Michelle. And like you said, we could <laughs> we could take one of these questions and spend the whole hour talking about them. but. Um, I think we also have some audience questions too. So Michael, I don't know how you wanna handle that. I wanna make sure that we're also giving the audience uh, the specific things that they're looking for. So happy to uh, go whichever way you want us to go, Michael. Yeah, no, there, there are some great questions here as well. So I think that one question is really regarding chief diversity officers um, preparing for their, their role, knowing that, right, there is um, you know, a commonality with, with high turnover in, in the position. Um, I think that right. Any insights on um, you know coming into yeah. that that kind of responsibility, that kind of challenge? Yeah, I would say. Um, I mean, there are lots of things, but I would say probably the top three things that you need to do. Uh, one is build your village. So you know, I think th these roles, being a CDO, can be very isolating, not just within your organization, but. Um, outside as well. And so, you know, finding other people that are in your industry, cross industry, et cetera, that are also doing this work, uh, it helps you in so many ways. One, it gives you just the camaraderie and the, the soft place to fall when you have a frustrating day, you will have frustrating days. Um, two, it gives you a really great thought partner. So if you're thinking about doing something um, you can go to those people in your village and say, hey, I'm thinking about this. Can, you know, can I bounce these ideas off of you? And then three, it also gives you um, a way to, to not uh, recreate the wheel because chances are someone in that village has done some of the things that maybe you're thinking about doing. They can tell you how to do them more successfully, how to avoid pitfalls, et cetera. So building that village of DEI practitioners is really key. And that can be as simple as a LinkedIn reaching out, um, you know, just networking within at conferences or different events that you may go to and, and start to build that village. Two is ground yourself in the work. I think one of the biggest challenges is that some organizations don't view diversity, equity, and inclusion as a subject matter uh, that requires expertise. Now, as I said before, I've been doing this work for 20 years and when I first started it, I didn't know what I was doing, right? I I, I moved over. I, I had been doing management consulting and I came into a, a diversity role. But what I did is I made a commitment to upskill myself. And some of it I did on my own. Some of it I asked my company to do. And you should also be asking your company to help upskill you. 
But, um, you know, there are tons of books, articles, podcasts out there that you can read on your own to really um, emerge yourself and submerge yourself into this topic. So do a lot of reading. There are, if you're new to the space, there are uh, a number of conferences that you can go to. SHRM, Society of Human Resource Management has an annual one. Um, the conference board has a really great DEI conference. Uh, Diversity Women has one. I could go on, um, but there are, that's another really great way to understand the topic and to meet people. And so, and then there's also certifications. If you feel like, you know, I don't know anything at all, you can get certified when it comes to DI. So I think you have a responsibility in this space, not only to upskill yourself in the beginning, but to make it a continuous improvement mindset where you're always learning because the, the topic uh, evolves and grows uh, with every single year. Um, I would say the second, the, the third thing you need to do is build your relationships and partnerships across the organization. So I talked earlier about integration and that really the role of a CDO is to integrate DEI into everything. So the reality is you will end up playing in a lot of people's sand, <clears throat> sandboxes. The number one thing you can do is before you start playing in their sandboxes is build a strong relationship. And so early on in your tenure, just reach out to people, set up. You should have a regular cadence with your key partners and different parts of the organization. Get to know them personally and ask them what they're struggling with and how you can help. Come there with a kind of a servant mindset, like how can I help you? And the number one thing that you can do is really um, present yourself as someone who is there to help them. So what I always said is like, help me help you and I need you to help me too, right? So we win together. And so I think if you can really drive that kind of relationship and partnership and mindset with the people that you'll be working with every day, with the parts of the organization where change is needed, they don't see you as much as a, you know, the DEI police or somebody coming in and, and you know, um, unveiling all the things they're doing wrong. It's the opposite. It's like, let's kill this together. Like, let's drive change together. And so then you come into it with a really strong partnership and a mindset around um, winning, uh, to use the Gaul's last W, that I think can really um, drive change. But if there is a bit of a confrontation there or adversarial stance, people will, I mean, do everything to make your job more difficult. And so I think it's how you present yourself as a partner and that's someone that's there to help as opposed to an adversary. Now, there may be times you need to challenge them as well, but I think if you built that relationship and people see you as a partner, it certainly helps. No, that's fantastic. Um, Want to also, you know, kind of bring into the, you know, topic, uh, the the recruiting aspects and, and getting the process started for, for a diversity hiring, it's kind of, you know, one starting point and you'd have to introduce new, technology, new approach, new methods. Um, is there anything specific with regards to the, uh, the technology aspect when trying to, you know, ask your, um, you know, diversity, uh, you know, um, goal, uh, you know, really to kind of align with, uh, you know, how you can introduce new technology to the, to the equation? You're asking me, Mike? Oh, please tell me about new technology for, for uh, diversity. All right, so um, first of all, the good news is there is technology that can help you source diverse talent. And it doesn't have to be going, you know, profile by profile and looking at pictures. Uh, we at Telenia identify diverse talent at 98% accuracy. So knowing who is who by diversity category is key. Then you should know that diverse talent describe themselves differently than white males. It may be uh, a shocking uh, news for you, but it is a reality after looking at millions of millions of profiles. Every category has a unique way of describing itself. And the bad news is diverse talent, women and minorities tend to put less skills on their profiles. So they come up much lower on you know, keyword search. And keyword search in itself is discriminatory because uh, it finds people with the right keyword, but not the right talent, and certainly not 
giving a fair chance to diverse talent or putting less skills, even though they have them. So technology is available. Uh, for some of our clients, we deliver 80% of the diverse applicant that they need to their pipeline. And it doesn't mean giving diverse talent any preferential treatment. It's just giving them a first chance to be considered and be hired based on their qualities and merits. I would like to add one thing, you know, I know we have DEI uh, executives and leaders on our call. Uh, uh, the last eye of investment is very important, especially when it comes to sourcing, because what, oftentimes we speak with the DEI leader of a company, they get excited with our technology. And then we find out they either have no budget or have very little budget. And they need to uh, go to the HR, to the recruitment leaders and beg for them to allow them to uh, introduce new technologies. So if you are starting your job as a DEI leader, uh, make sure that you have enough budget to implement some technologies or that you have uh, the budget of the uh, recruitment are also designated for that goal. Otherwise, you will not be able to leverage the technology and it's, uh, it's there. I, I think we have a lot of questions and uh, we have 15 minutes, Mike, and maybe we can just answer the questions. Yeah, I would love to, I would love to go through if that's, if that's all right with everyone. Um, really, you know, one of the, one of the questions that, um, that did come up is really this diversity uh, in relation to, to human resources and, and really, um, you know, um, for some organizations, really the chief diversity officer reports in to a, like a chief HR, uh, other organizations reports into a, a CEO. Um, Michelle, Tamika, any, any comments on really kind of the, the pros and cons and kind of how we can, uh, you know, really approach that, that as a, as a challenge or, or a potential opportunity, I suppose, uh, you know, to have, um, HR and, and Chief Diversity Officer work closely together? I have very strong opinions on this. Uh, and, and they're built from my personal experience and that of dozens of my peers in this space. So I think the ideal reporting relationship is for a CDO to report directly to the CEO. If not a CEO, then um, someone who is driving the business. So maybe a COO, depending on what industry you're in and, uh, and how the company is set up. Um, but I think if DEI is a business imperative, which we all know it is, having it connected very directly to the leader of the company that drives the business to me is uh, really paramount. And we also know that as Michelle said earlier, the commitment has to start from the top down. Now, why, in addition to reporting to the CEO, ideally, maybe a CEO secondarily, there should be a very strong relationship to the CHRO. Um, to me, um, you know, that should be one of your biggest peers, uh, but just what I said, a peer, not a reporting relationship. The reality is uh, also, as Michelle mentioned earlier, that a lot of the work that CDOs are doing is to dismantle inequitable systems that have been built over time. And when there is a reporting relationship between DEI and HR, there's a conflict of interest, plain and simple in my opinion, as opposed to me going to my peer and saying, listen, as I said before, we're in this together, we're gonna win together, Let's work and look at the different components within HR and how do we uh, work collectively to drive DEI into them, to look at where we are now, where we wanna go, what our gaps are and address those gaps. Like that's a conversation. If I report to the CHRO, I'm almost asking for permission as opposed to having a conversation as a peer to say, this is, this is my remit, it's also your remit and how do we work together to do this? So I think, quite frankly, that one of the reasons why we have not seen uh, sustainable progress over time is because DEI has been reporting to HR, and the, um, a lot of the things that need to be unearthed and changed aren't being changed. I think the other reason that is problematic for DEI to report to HR is the message it sends to the organization. What you're saying is that DEI is an HR thing. It's up to that HR team to figure it out and to fix it. I've even had, when I joined a company, even though I 
at the time I didn't even report to into HR. I reported to the CEO, but people said, we're so glad you're here to fix us. And it's like, first of all, no, it's not my job as a CEO. Secondly, that's how people unfortunately view DEI work because that's how it's been positioned for so many years. As opposed to, as I said before, the compelling why on DEI makes us better, makes us stronger, allows us to attract and keep the best talent, allows us to drive growth for our business and allows us to be a good corporate citizen. That's a completely different conversation and vision of what DEI is rather than it's an HR thing that needs fixing. And so I think there are many reasons why DEI has been marginalized. One of them is because it reports to HR. So I feel really strongly that it should be in partnership with HR and not a reporting relationship for all of those reasons. And my perspective on that is DEI should be a chief position, not a manager, not a director. It should be a chief position that sits in the senior executive suite and sits as an equal strategic business partner to all units. So, you know, when it comes to human resources, as Tamika has said, and I've had this experience as well, working in the public private nonprofit sector in DE&I and um, overseeing DE&I for the Commonwealth of Kentucky through uh, our uh, previous governor's administration, there are challenges when it comes to engaging. And you can look at SHRM's uh, reports, a lot of the surveys that they've done of HR professionals around diversity, equity, and inclusion. When we're talking about the issues that come up specific to DEI, you know, for a long time, there were very few um, white HR leaders who even felt that race was a problem in our organizations. Well, we know <laughs> that it's still a problem within our organizations. We know that we're still had, having issues with a lot of things within our organizations. So if the folks in HR don't see it as a problem, then they're certainly not going to prioritize the work or the person there who's doing the work. And it's hard to be in a position to where you're expected to come in once again and lead these efforts and not be seen and respected for the talent that you bring, to not be uh, have the space, if you will, to exercise your subject matter expertise to really impact the organization. So um, it's, it's critical to make sure that the position is seated in the right place on your organizational chart. And again, that they have the proper level of respect and authority to be able to move the work forward. Um, when it comes to HR, they are positioned to be the greatest ally, if you will, because their entire realm of responsibility is around supporting or each organization's greatest asset, and that is your work, no matter your workforce, excuse me, no matter what your purpose is, no matter what your goal is, no matter what your product or service line, you cannot be successful in a business without people to help you carry forth what it is that you hope to do. So having HR understand that a chief diversity officer is there to work in partnership with them and not see them as a threat, regardless of what they have to uncover. You know, that allows HR the opportunity to really exercise with the, the greatest level of integrity around wanting to make sure that the people in the organization are cared for properly and that they're having a fantastic experience, an experience that affirms, acknowledges, and adds value to the total experience of everyone who's there, which is something that, you know, every organization promises to do. You know, when you look at most organizational um, value statements, they say things like respect and, 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 you know, practice integrity, and they want innovation, and they want creativity, and they want all of these wonderful things from employees. Organizations have a responsibility to make sure that they're providing the cultures and environments that will cultivate that in individuals who choose to bring their talents and skills to their organizations. So it's critical to make sure that the conversation happens, as Tamika said, at the level that it should, with the proper level of respect and reverence being extended across both sides. And I want to make one quick point um, about how chief diversity officers need to carry and conduct themselves. I have to say that I don't think it's upon the chief diversity officer to always have to walk on eggshells and, and kind of make sure that they're not uh, doing anything to rattle or, or, or make people uncomfortable because often um, you have people of color serving in these positions, black women especially in a lot of these positions. And there are some very challenging conversations that need to be had and issues that must be confronted. And organizational leaders need to resist if you will, the desire and the traditional tendency to label these individuals as confrontational, overly aggressive, and not team players when they have to bring up these difficult issues. So I don't want 
diversity officers to think that it's upon them to make sure everybody feels okay and that everybody's comfortable and that they're not appearing as threatening because that is the assumption. It's a stereotype, if you will, that's applied to many people of color, women especially, Black women especially, when they are leading these efforts and having these conversations. So I want to encourage anybody who's on here listening, who is a chief diversity officer, stand firm in who you are, be confident in what you do, assert what's necessary, invite people into the conversation and have these discussions in a way that, that everyone knows that the goal is progress. No matter how difficult the conversations are, the goal is progress. And again, it's incumbent upon organizations to respect how the information is being presented and those who are willing to make those points and bring them to the forefront. Michelle, I will say amen to that. I, one of the key things I say is that we have prioritized comfort over progress for too long. It is not my job as CDO to make you feel comfortable. There are uncomfortable truths that we need to confront if we want to drive progress. And so I would absolutely agree that this idea of this work is comfortable. That needs to go out of the window. You need to get comfortable being uncomfortable uh, both as a CDO and for anyone that you're working with or progress will never happen. Change is rarely comfortable, no matter what the change is. And so that, that whole notion has prevented so many organizations from moving the needle. And it's one of the biggest things that you'll hear as a pushback if you're trying to do training or something, well, I don't want to make people uncomfortable. Guess what? You should want to make them uncomfortable because that's where the change happens. No, I think that's, um, Michelle, you, you've really gotten a lot of the audience as well, uh, you know, clapping along at, you know, agreeing to that specific point of, right, I mean, you're, you're here in the name of progress. And so absolutely. Um, sorry, Gal, you were going to say? I want to ask Tamika, you know, looking back 20 years, you've had multiple DEI leadership roles. Uh, would you have done anything differently in your career if you had the chance? Um, you know, every role has been different and, and, you know, I joined, I joined this space back before it was popular or, or in response to, uh, to, uh, crises going on in society. And, and I applaud my early, uh, companies for doing this work well before it was something a lot of people were doing. Um, if I were to say one thing that I would do differently, honestly, Gall, is I, because in most of my roles I have reported to HR, I would have thought not to report to HR and to change my reporting relationship. But early on, I didn't know that was a thing. Um, you know, you, and, and I, I wanna make clear, I'm not saying HR is an adversary, but I go back to the point that we're making, if we really wanna drive change, we all need to recognize we're in this together and it needs to be a partnership. Um, that drives that change. And so that would probably be the one thing I would do differently is to push for um, a different reporting structure that would enable not just myself, but the company to make progress. Because like I said, this is not about the individual leading the work. It is about the company fulfilling its vision and driving a business imperative that quite frankly, if they don't do, they're going to be left behind. And so for me, it is looking at it from the perspective of what are you missing out on by not doing this? And I mean, the, the, the answer to that is a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Michelle, Michelle, just uh, we have two more minutes, just a quick question. Uh, do you think that most companies today uh, are serious about diversity or most companies just pay a lip service to diversity? You want me to cover that in two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, the pressure. <laughs> let, let me just say, you know, I started out my career over 20 years ago in civil rights enforcement. So I was the government official who would come into organizations and investigate your workplace discrimination and harassment complaints and help you figure out what you needed to do to make sure you were meeting compliance expectations. Um, and then I went from that to overseeing diversity, equity, and inclusion for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And then I left government and started uh, my own firm uh, doing this work because I got tired of being silenced. I got tired of being in organizations and being made to feel like I couldn't speak the truths that needed to be spoken. I couldn't confront 
and address the issues. So now, you know, I consider myself to be a, uh, a workplace activist, if you will. The things that we talk about in society, it's, it's perpetuated within our workplaces and it's perpetuated through the systems that we have in place within our organizations. And to put out a, a DEI statement is not enough. To say we want more diverse uh, recruitment is not enough. I think if nothing else, what I hope that people have gleaned, and I, I'm so sorry we didn't get to all of your questions in today's session, but I hope that if you've gleaned nothing else from this conversation, it's that before you bring in diverse talent, you got to make sure your culture is ready for it. You've got to make sure that when folks come into your organization, especially the diverse talent that you seek, that your folks are ready to receive them and ensure that they have the type of employment experience that you promise through all of who you state you are, through your mission, your vision, and your values. And if you don't have the systems that are in place to make sure that the experience is what you offer, then you're undermining your own integrity, your own uh, commitment, your own purpose, your own worth as an organization to not do so. So to answer the question of whether or not organizations are committed, I can't, you know, I would never make the assumption, um, uh, you know, that no one is. I, I don't know. The question for organizations is to ask themselves, are you truly committed to following through on your promises. And to be honest in having that discussion and to bring all of the players to the table so that you can get perspective from across the organization, as opposed to just a few folks talking about what they hope is happening. It's time to have these conversations. We cannot continue to delay this because our workplaces right now need it. Our people need it. And after everything that we've been through over the past couple of years, we have the greatest opportunity to make the most positive impact on people's lives in the spaces and places where they spend the most time, where they choose to show up every single day. The least we can do as employers, as organizations, is make sure that we honor all that they bring to us and entrust to us. Thank you. No, that's fantastic. Um, Thank you so much to, to Michelle, Tamika, Gall, um, all of you guys um, joining us for our conversation today. Some really, really helpful and useful insights. And I think that, right, these kinds of conversations are really helping, uh, you know, everyone get on the same page with really, you know, what are some of the best ideas? What are, uh, you know, some of the things to look at when it comes to approaching this, this very complex and sensitive topic, but very important topic. It's really, you know, as we are, uh, you know, working remotely working in the office we're working every day trying to make progress you know i love this idea that right we're all going to win together uh you know we're all going to progress and and move forward together so that's absolutely fantastic um thanks again michelle tamika and gall really a pleasure to, to speak with you all today thanks for your time and thanks for all of our listeners too thank you thank you, thank you. Take care, everyone. Take care. have a good day